Hello and welcome to this review of Highway of Eternity by Clifford D. Simak. This is, this was an enjoyable book. It's probably a runner-up for one of my favourite of Simak books or, though, and it's a rather chunky one by comparison. I have to say that with Simak, my favourite book does tend to be whichever book I'm reading, but there you go. So what I've got here is quite a nice little cover um, from the 80s, I think it's from, yeah, 86, 86, 87. And a Mandarin paperback, which is an imprint of the Octopus Publishing Group, which I like because I like Octopus. It's got a pretty good cover. It's very science fictiony, perhaps a little bit more science fictiony than the story actually is. And in the 80s, they published a whole heap of these Simak books where you had a triangle instead of the A in his name. I've got a few of them, uh, not as many as I used to have. Simak was one I've been reading for many years and I tended to give away the books when I'd finished them. A mistake I am no longer making. More on that in another video. So, Simak is such an interesting author. I'll start a bit with Simak before I get to the book. He has been writing science fiction since the 30s. His first work came out sometime in the 30s. It had a very pedestrian sort of name. I think it might have been Empire. Then he had a scattering of ones published in the 40s and then in the 50s. So he started off his writing career in what people seem to call these days the golden age of science fiction or golden science fiction. And... Um, but he kept on write, writing until his last published book during his lifetime, Highway of Eternity, in the 80s. I think he died in 88, and this was his last published work. Since then, I've seen another one come out posthumously. It came out enough years later that I suspect it's a collection of works that he hadn't published or he didn't consider were ready to be published, so I'm not sure, I'm not sure if I'm going to make an effort to chase down that one, but I would like to chase down all the others. My first experiences of Simak was when I was a, quite young and family members had Enchanted Pilgrimage and Goblin Reservation, both of which I have again. I'm not sure which of them I read first, but I read them both pretty shortly after each other. I really enjoyed one while I was a little bit disappointed by the other. I was quite young for them. I think I was probably 11 or 12. And Simak's books have a complexity and often a non-linearity to the story that I think may, means that Eleven was perhaps a bit young for it. Now, Simak's writing. I think he has, I think he has over 20 novels and a whole heap of stories because he wrote in that classic story publishing era that America had. And I would like them all. I only have about half of the novels and who knows with the stories. Now, I am so fascinated by Simak's writing, and I do find it so enjoyable, and that is kind of almost an oddity, because Simak has got some quirks that I normally wouldn't find all that wonderful. So, you know how you have some authors who, they're just the flawless reading experience for you. You feel that you could read anything of theirs. You're willing to buy their books sight unseen. You have no doubt that you will enjoy them, and you always do that. Kind of isn't Simak for me because while I always enjoy his writing and I remember him as an author that I enjoy very much he's got the flaws that he's got could be significant for other people <clears throat> and I've got no idea at all why they aren't significant for me first start his characters and his dialogue almost inevitably at least in part, are going to be wooden, stiff, and unconvincing. I'm a big fan of good dialogue, and when it's stilted, I can be annoyed. But with Simak, I can see the stiltedness and not be annoyed, which is odd. He has secondary characters which often behave very erratically for no apparent reason or purpose other than to force the primary character and the narrative in a specific direction. That is not a thing I always love either. I want reasons for why people do things, and if there's no good reasons, then omnivorous reader gets into irate reader territory. 
Again, Simic gets away with it almost inevitably. I notice the incidents, and there's certainly plenty here, but they don't bother me as they probably would elsewhere. Okay, his stories can be overcomplicated in strange ways. So if you've got a story and you've got a focus, but aren't actually going forward on that story all the time, but have all these side diversions that go all over the place, side branches that don't seem to enhance the primary story, and sometimes they never even relate to it or come back to it or have endings. And when you've got a larger book, you're more likely to get that than when you have a teeny tiny book like, I don't know, The Werewolf Principle, for example. Even though, but even the small ones have these diversions that would seem pointless. And for many authors, I'd read them and think, well, I don't see what the point of that was. With Simak, I don't seem to mind as much. Very odd. And the other, the other thing that he definitely has is an aversion to endings. His endings often aren't. They just don't have resolution or purpose they leave it open-ended for a book that you know won't come because he doesn't really repeat themes or protagonists very much and that's another thing his primary protagonist is most often a very ordinary and not very interesting person that's very unlike a lot of the golden age science fiction writers i think so all of these flaws exist in this book quite extensively does it bother me not at all i really enjoyed this book go figure I can't figure it out. His actual writing style, again, it feels adequate, workmanlike, good craft, good skills, good editing. He understands his grammar and his English. And yet there's nothing there that is so beautiful that engrosses you in every sentence. So, I honestly don't know why I like Simak as much as I do, but I do. So, in Highway to Eternity, we start with a really, really strong hook. We start with a character called Boone, who's in Singapore when he gets a message from an old friend. And what the message says is, I need someone who can walk around corners, I think is the phrase used. And he comes back home, which is somewhere in America. What we find out when these two characters, Boone and Cochran, meet is that Boone has got an ability to just vanish from the world into this other place, what he calls walking around a corner. Come on then. No. What he calls walking around a corner. Um, and they discovered this almost at the same time. So Boone used to be a journalist and he was in a couple of war type zones. Cochran arrived with, I'm going to say probably troops after some major catastrophic event and finds Boone wandering around, the only thing left alive. And from there it transpires that at the moment of certain destruction, Boone just suddenly does what he calls turning a corner into somewhere else where he stays for a short time and then when it's safe comes back. Fascinating ability. Through the narrative of these two friends, we also find out that Cochrane has had a medical event, I think it is, which has meant that he can see things that no one else can see. And that's why he's called Boone back. What Cochrane is these days is a supply of information. And some time back, a mysterious man arrived asking for certain types of information for which he pays huge amounts. Cochrane, not trusting him, got his operatives to follow this man back to a particular hotel. Federation hotel? A something hotel. A... a uh, uh, I don't care so much what this hotel was called. It just barely doesn't exist in the story for all intents and purposes. Okay, never mind. He's had this person followed back to the hotel, and when he looked into it, he found this person had a suite where he lived, only it didn't show any signs of actual living. And when he walked past this place, he could see on the outside a balcony that shouldn't exist and which no one else could see. So he was brought, brought Boone in to see if Boone can actually get into this balcony. Now, they're exploring the room when all of a sudden Boone realised this hotel that's been due for demolition is being demolished right now with them inside it. With this impetus 
of imminent sudden danger. He grabs Cochrane and turns sideways into this balcony that shouldn't be there and which they hadn't been able to find before attached to the building. And this is the start of a really interesting story. The person who hired this room originally vanished after Cochrane gave him some information <coughs> about inquiries that were being set forward on a place called Hopkins Acre. Hopkins Acre didn't exist, but it used to. What happened, or maybe they're in, maybe they're in England? Hopkins Acre's in England, anyway. What happened with Hopkins Acre is that it vanished one day. All of a sudden, the whole area, the hall, the grounds, the people on it, the cattle, everything just vanished and was never seen again. And in time, Boone and Cochrane might make their way through this veranda that isn't there um, to Hopkins Acre and finds it's inhabited by a family from the very, very far future when the world has been not invaded by aliens, but has an alien race that are trying to convince people to lose their corporate bodies in search of immortality. One of the members of the family, Henry, started on this process but decided against it. So he's half immortal, which is to say he has no body. He's just this little collection of sparkles that no one but Cochrane can see really easily. And he can talk to people in their head. So here you've got all these fascinating, fascinating elements, right? They're great. And each one of them, each one of them could really be a book all on its own. It's like the man who can see things that aren't there, the man who can step around corners into some place. He doesn't know what it is or how it exists, but it's there for him when he needs it. And these characteristics continue throughout the novel. But none, neither them nor the protagonists who have these characteristics become a really central part of the novel. Instead, while they're staying at Hopkins Acre, the family there are discovered by the aliens who were trying to dis dis extinguish the human race. No really good re reason for this is ever demonstrated either, by the way. I would have liked some reasoning. You'd think that Hopkins Acre, they've been there for centuries apparently, you'd think they'd have some concept, some idea, at least a theory that isn't completely lame about why these infinites want to extinguish the human race and turn them into small sparkly lights. They don't. They send a hunter killer robot after the family. The family all jump in these time traveling box machines that they've got. They're split up into three groups. And then for the rest of Highway of Eternity, we've got these three, three groups and each one of them has their own adventure. Boone matches up with the younger woman from the family. They end up in the prehistoric past with um, prehistoric past of America. So that's time and space jumping. That's weird. Anyway, and a whole heap of stuff happens there. Um, Cochrane matches with David, who's the younger man of the family and quite a nice guy. They find themselves in the future, in Cochrane's future, but David's past. And when they talk to people on Earth, they find a whole heap of stuff. You've got robots who do all the work. People only have to sit around and think. I'm going to say it right now. Men have to sit around and think. Female characters are not a strong feature of this book. There's a couple of them and they're integrated, but the main protagonists are very much men. And when we go into the past future and find these old men sitting around a table eating soup and bread and thinking about the universe, a small part of me thinks, you know what? I feel like that level of introspection would have been less present if that had been a gender integrated community. Just one of those small feelings that I got through the novel. Anyway, people go off in different directions. There's different aliens, there's different stories, there are different hypotheses, and it's all a lot of fun. But thinking back on it, it's hard to really say what this level, this story is about, except a possible time travelly future and past adventure not a particularly adventurous adventure either because there's well there's lots of interesting concepts there's low on the action uh, and this is probably why if you go online say to goodreads a default of mine 
and try and figure out what this book is about. It's really, really hard. And every single description that I've read falls short, wouldn't be the description I'd give, and I think concentrates on the wrong thing. So let's go with Goodreads right now. Um, we've got a three and a half star rating overall, 3.69 from nearly a thousand ratings. There's only got, it's got less than a hundred views. So a lot of other people felt that they couldn't do much with this either. And it starts with two present day investigators race across time to escape malevolent aliens from their future and their terrible gift of immortality in this classic, in this science fiction classic. These guys aren't investigators. They're curious. But they're not investigators and they're not only one of them ever sees a malevolent alien really um the gift of immortality whether it's a gift or not and i'm inclined to think to agree with the characters that it's not only none, none of our two main protagonists are ever offered this it's all over the place and then starts asking about the price of eternal life and no one here thinks very much about the price of eternal life because they're all pretty sure that turning into a sparkly thing isn't going to give them immortal life, even though the aliens who are trying to force it on humanity say it is. Then you have other aliens doing completely other things. Like always, Simak has good robots. His robots are basically human, only metallic, and they're doing their own thing. So that's good. I always like his robots. There's a dog because Simak loved dogs and there has to be. This one's a wolf. Some of the reviews claim that the wolf is meant to be the inheritor of the earth after mankind. I've got no idea where they got that notion from. I go, no, no, not that one. There is a small hint that there, the trees may be the inheritors of mankind. A unique one, that one. I don't mind it. There's a huge tree that only Cochrane can see and when he starts to climate falls sideways on to the highway of eternity which is represented on the cover by that long white thing i think which you can travel for ever and ever maybe our heroes travel parts of it and they find an a diner with a robot making them hamburgers for lunch it's like it's just so much stuff and the way simak tells it it feels linear it feels logical it feels It feels like he's writing a story, but you may expect more beginning content characters and, and, and dialogue than you get from this actual book. I still really enjoy it. I've seen a few reviewers who really despise the ending because it isn't one. And if I, if this was my first Simac and I was buying it with no expectations other than the reviews on the back of the book, and all the rest of it, then I probably too would be disappointed. I bought this because this was Simak and I know I enjoy reading him. If you have never read a Simak, this probably isn't a terrible one to start with. There's probably better ones as well. Um, Shakespeare's Planet or City, I think they've got a more consistent storyline. If you find yourself not liking Simak's actual writing, I don't think there's much here for you. If the writing bothers you or you haven't enjoyed previous Simak books, I'm not sure how you'll go with this one. But for those people who like science fiction, classic or golden age or whatever, for its own sake, I think there's a lot here for all of us. The characters, the robots, the questions about immortality and foreign worlds. The only thing that those of us who are classic science fiction writers, blood and bone, uh, aren't perhaps going to like, is the ending. While the ending didn't bother me, I feel that there, that's the place where Simak has the most, I'm gonna say, flaws in what he's done with this book. It feels like he's trying too hard to wrap up all the different storylines and the mechanism that he uses to do it, while not I'm not going to spoil the ending. The rest of it can be spoiled. But the mechanism he uses to do it is unlikely. It's not that I hadn't seen it coming. I had a feeling that Simak was going to do this, but it's not convincing and it's not necessary. There's plenty of other ways he could have tied a bow on this book without creating something as artificial 
This ending for most authors and most books would probably strongly suggest they were planning on writing a follow-up and they wanted you to become curious as to what would happen next. With Simak, it isn't. And I don't believe that he ever wrote a follow-up to anything and I'm just quite sure he wasn't going to write a follow-up to this one. This was just, I finished my story. I want to end it. This is the quick way that I'm going to tie it all up. His attempt to tie it all up and end a lot of storylines and answer a lot of questions actually created a worse one. Have I intrigued you about the ending? Do you like reading classic science fiction? Then I recommend Highway for Eternity when you're in the mood for this kind of a book. Thank you for watching. Like, comment, subscribe, all that sort of stuff. And my next video I'm planning to try and figure out how to wriggle that camera around and show you my library as of before because very exciting. There's soon going to be an after. Have a good day.